exercise 3.2. They have a trademark with a book value of 3.5 million. And IFRS requires it to be assessed for impairment annually. So to perform the test, they're going to estimate the value using IFRS 13. And they've come up with these cash flow estimates based on internal information. And they reflect the estimated cash flows over the next eight years. And the asset is assumed to have no salvage value. Here's what we have. Our estimated cash flows, there's a 20% chance of the cash flows, the, like the net cash inflows, right, being 380. There's a 50-50 chance of it being 630. So this is using probabilities to help us estimate kind of best case scenarios and worst case scenarios. So we're saying worst case scenario, 380,000, and there's a 20% chance of that happening. What we have to do then basically is take these estimated cash flows and use it to come up with a single overall weighted average estimate. So all we need to do is 380 times your 20, and yeah. 630 times your 50, 750 times your 30, and add them up. That's Six, right. 616,000. Excellent. Thank you very much. Right. So, yeah, um, because all of these add up to 100%. So, 380 times 20% is 76,000. This is 315,000 and 225. If we think of our calculator now, so I'm going I'm to write the buttons down. So, we have N, I, Y. We have PV, we have PMT, and we have FV. What's N? Eight. Eight. That's right. It's saying, you know, these are the estimated cash flows over the next eight years. So N is eight. What's the interest rate? Eight. Eight. If you look down here, because what we're asked to do is calculate the fair value. It's is fair value in use, in essence. So eight on Y. Do we know the PV? The 616. No, we're calculating the PV. Okay, since we're on the subject of the 616, what is the 616? What does it represent for the buttons? It's a payment because this 16, right, is based on, so each one of these are annual estimates. So this is basically saying we could see in any one year somewhere between 380 and 750. What we're doing is using the probabilities to kind of smooth out that payment. And we expect to get that weighted average every year for the next eight years. So it's an ongoing, it's a cash flow that occurs more than once. That means it's a PMT. So 616. And if the, if the trade name was to maybe have a salvage value after eight years, you would put in that as a future value. Absolutely. After that, you're just, you're reading my mind. So this last one here, it says, is assumed to have no salvage value. This is telling us that the FV equals zero. So that uh, salvage value or resale value at that end represents also an additional cash flow, which then would, we would include in our total cash flow. So as you can see, we have cash flows that can be regular or we can have a one-time cash flow. So in this case, our future value is zero because there's no residual or there's no salvage value. So what is the PV? 3,539,929. Let's not worry about the pennies. So this is the PV or the value in use because we're using it to generate those cash flows. All we've done now is determine the PV and answered the question, what's the estimated fair value? Okay, so that's what we did. So PV, uh, value in use, fair value, uh, same kind of idea. Do we need to impair this asset? So we're going to compare to what we call the carrying value or book value. So this 3.5 million is the book value, right? BV. The textbooks are now starting to call this carrying value, CV. It's the same as NBV, which is net book value, which is basically after accumulated depreciation, right? So BV, CV, NBV are all the same thing. So I'm just going to use CV because that's what we're trying to get everybody to think about. So right now, the carrying value or the value on the balance sheet is 3500000 This is the test. Is the value in use more or less than the carrying value? It's more. It's more. So is the asset impaired? Um, no. No, because its current carrying value is less than the value in use. The fair value is greater than the carrying value, therefore no impairment. Is this a level one, level two, or level three estimate? Three. Level three estimate. 
because it's the highest amount of subjectivity involved. And the last part, uh, we're not going to uh, go ahead and draft the note, but let's talk about uh, items that contribute to what we call measurement uncertainty. As we go from level one to level three, because we are starting to rely on more judgment and estimates as opposed to actual real proof, the value of a share of Apple on a date is undisputed. You've got the, the market quote to prove it. And so we could say then there is little to no uncertainty or little to no measurement uncertainty around valuing stocks. They trade at what they trade. And as we progress through the levels, levels two and three, the measurement uncertainty starts to grow. What are some sources of measurement uncertainty in this scenario? What are we having to make some guesses about? Because that's the way you can equate it. If you have to start making estimates, then that increases uncertainty, which then increases risk. So what are you having to make guesses about here? Your cash flow, the market at, in eight years. You, so you're talking about the cash flow estimates? Yes. Okay. So the cash flows themselves represent uncertainty. Well, how the heck do you come up with 380? 380, 630, 750? Those numbers, first of all, they're pretty far apart. That's one thing that represents an, uh, an element of uncertainty. What else is a source of uncertainty in this model? In length of time. Okay, the time. Does eight years even make sense? Is there a market for this product over eight years? Is the market shorter? Is the market longer? Okay, what else? Probability. Ah, the probabilities. Sure. Okay, so you may have some internal information that says, okay, over the last three years, this is where our cash flows are, but it's still a guess. Is it 21%? Is it 25? Is it 15? That adds to the level of uncertainty. Absolutely. Uh, what else? The estimation is 8% for the interest rate. So it's not yeah. fixed. The interest rate. How'd you come up with 8%? What is that reflective of? And here's an interesting thing. What happens if we change the interest rate from 8 to 9%? So all you need to do is put 9N, now compute the PV. At 9%, the PV equals 3,409 or 48. Would this be impaired now? Yes. Yes. So the interest rate alone. And what happens if you put 7%? Just put 7 and recompute. The opposite. It, the opposite yeah. app. It goes up. <laughs> So as the interest rate drops, the present value goes up. And as the interest rate increases, the present value goes down. Uh, is there another thing that can contribute to uncertainty of the model? What about the salvage value? They say it's worth nothing, but is it really worth nothing? Like, is that what you expect to have a machine that's completely worthless? Like, could you get scrap for it? Something, right? So all of these little things contribute to an overall potential for measurement uncertainty. And what has to happen then, of course, if you're undertaking this kind of value and use analysis, you need to disclose in the financial statements the approach that you're using and what contributes to the potential uncertainty so that a user of the financial statements doesn't just go, how the heck did you come up with that? You go, well, we came up with it using this, 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 and this. And we understand that these are sources of uncertainty. And you know what? This is our best guess. So, and the auditors will say, yeah, okay, 